Hey, Scream Therapy listeners. As you might imagine, doing the Scream Therapy podcast over the past year and a half has been emotionally heavy and a lot of work. Now that the podcast has reached 40 episodes, I've decided to take a break for a while so I can come back recharged. But fear not, during Scream Therapy's absence, I'm bringing you a spin off podcast. It's called Flex Your Head. Each episode, I dissect a classic punk album with one of my dear friends as a guest. This episode, I bring on my friend Greg Pratt. Greg and I have known each other for many, many years. Besides us both being music writers, we've sold punk rock records together, put on shows, and have spent way too much time obsessing over thrash and death metal cassettes. Welcome to the first episode of Flex Your Head. Let's do this. Hey Greg, how's it going today? Good, how are you doing? Pretty good. So what's the album we're talking about in today's podcast? Well, today we're looking at uh, the one and only Propagandy's 2009 album, Supporting Cast. That's right. All right, so Supporting Cast came out in 2009, like you said. It was on G7 Welcoming Committee Records. It might have been one of the last G7 releases, and also Small Man Records. Um, and then it was recording at the Blasting Room, which is Propagandy's kind of house studio at this point in Colorado by Bill Stevenson and Stefan Egerton of Descendants, and Illegal Combatant Studios in Winnipeg, which I'm assuming is maybe Chris's basement studio. I believe so, yes. All right, so opening thoughts on the album. Let's do this. Oh, well, I mean, the supporting cast, it's such an interesting one to me. I know it's a lot of people's favorite propaganda album. It came after Potemkin City Limits, which is my favorite propaganda album. Yeah, I'm well aware of that. We've talked about yeah, it. Yeah. <laughs> In fact, you tried to coax yes. me into doing that album with on the podcast today, but I was pretty adamant. Right. Yeah, fair enough. It's not everyone's favorite album, Potemkin, but, you know, for some reason that album, uh, you know, really, really was just like the exact, like, sound and everything that I wanted. So coming out of Potemkin, when one of your favorite bands releases your favorite album, where do you go from there? So supporting cast always had this this slight air of, you know, not disappointment by any means, but just trying to follow up the perfect album. So it, it never quite, you know, got out of that shadow for me. So it's sort of yeah. an interesting album because it was always sort of had that lingering over it. But, you know, that that aside, the album rules it rules and yeah i mean it totally rules it's such a great album the production is is so great sounding the songs are are for the most part you know just really really good it's a great album without going into too much of the details which we will in a second i mean that's just my kind of opening overall thoughts is just what a fantastic album that's stood the test of time obviously very yeah. well no i totally agree i mean we've talked about this this is my favorite propaganda album I listen to it way more than the rest of them. I'm kind of on the same level with you and Potemkin. It's, we could argue about it for, for days. But um, one of the things I noticed, because I know you're huge on shorter albums, and Potemkin yes. was about 41 minutes, but Supporting yep. Cast is 52. And I wonder that maybe that's part of it too? Yeah. So, I mean, it is and it isn't. It's 52 because of the bonus track stuff. So this is actually a huge stumbling point for me. And this is just me being a weirdo, 100%. <laughs> but when I look at an album, you know, when I put in the CD or get it ready in the computer or streaming or whatever, and I see 52 minutes, I just think, I, I don't want to listen to a punk rock album that's 52 minutes long. Even though I know it's because there's 10 minutes of, of bonus stuff on this this album, which I could easily just, just ignore. So it's me being an uptight weirdo. Sure. I was listening to it yesterday a few times, obviously, trying to get ready for this. You can't get ready for this. It's impossible, but we're doing our best. Yeah. Right? Yeah. <laughs> and then I thought, well, I'll put it on today a couple of times. And I thought, you know what? I'm just going to listen to it in my head because I have it memorized you know, every <laughs> single line, every single note. Yeah. So that was me realizing that 
you know, when you listen to something thousands and thousands of times, I mean, Metallica, Master of Puppets, Slayer, Rain and Blood, whatever the case mm-hmm. may be. I think this is why I think it's my best propaganda album is because I know it. It's there. It's ingrained. I don't have any reason to really analyze it too much. Mm-hmm. Of course, you know, there's so much to analyze, but uh, it's also a very comforting album. Yes. One of my biggest problems with Potemkin and not to... Uh, belabor this too much but it feels really depressing Potemkin it feels you know the whole idea sure. with Glenn Lambert on the bed with the shotgun and <laughs> that whole thing yeah. the whole Chris Hanna alter ego it just feels yeah. really down whereas this album even though right. there's really heavy subjects still it has that kind of energy to me more flow that idea of it being one of those albums that just gets stuck I totally agree I mean this album almost and we'll get to this in a minute but it's almost i mean all the records are really completely really ingrained in my head i've listened to them all so many times i just love this band so much but yeah this one you're right in particular it wormed its way in i think part of that is like just the fact that it sounds so good and these songs are so well written and there's it's just like this compact songwriting economic songwriting like you know they did a really good job in the songs in this album so yeah i think they are they're just in there. I totally agree in, yeah. in your head. Let's talk about some of the songs then. Uh, the one thing that I thought was really funny in one of the official, well, official, they don't have anything that's really official, but on their website or something, one of those goofy Chris Hanna write-ups, it says 12-song collection of boundless power and depth, a 50,000-watt forward-thinking tip of the hat to the giants, Voivod, Rush, SNFU, Sacrifice, Razor, and Guilt Parade. <laughs> that was pretty hilarious. Because, I mean, do you see this album being influenced by those bands? I guess it is. I mean, they're stating that it is, but from your perception. No, I, I would never put on, you know, uh, Guilt Dear Parade? Coach's Corner. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I, would never put, <laughs> I would never put on Dear Coach's Corner and think, hey, this sure sounds like uh, Xanadu, you know, by Rush. Like it's, you know. yeah. But I know that, yeah, those guys are... Uh, much like you and me, you know, really deeply into, you know, the Voivods and the sacrifices of, of the world and whatnot. Although I've never been a guilt, I don't know if I've ever heard a guilt parade record. I'm going to get that out in the open right now. I missed out on that band for some reason. Yeah. But, crossover punk, hardcore stuff. Okay. They're good. Right. Although cool. Corpus Vile isn't on this list, which is kind of a disappointment. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I do remember that, that exact blog post or whatever it was. Then when the album came out, I kind of thought, well, I mean, it just kind of, sounds like propaganda it doesn't sound like boy but i mean that that's a good thing you know it's what we want mm-hmm. some of the individual songs i mean there, there's so many we don't want this podcast to go on for for three hours but we got 30 minutes let's okay so <laughs> so yeah yeah let's do it so uh night letters the, the opener i think this is a good starting point not just because it's the opener but what a way to start an album this song sounds like no other propaganda song before or since it sounds like no other band it's it's just because it's a todd song and todd's... it's the only album that starts with a todd song by the way it's the only yeah, album that right. has a todd song it's track number one yeah good point and what a what a great way to start i remember when it when it first came on when i first sat down and spun it for the very first time i was just blown away that it was a uh, this weird raging Todd song to start the album. It's a great opener. It's a great song. It just gives me goosebumps every time I spin it. You know, I love, I love Night Letters. Dear Coach's Corner, of course. I mean, I feel like that kind of became a, a favorite of everyone for good reason. I mean, it's just a, just a fantastic song. I loved uh, uh, Potemkin City Limits, the song on this album. It might be my favorite song on this album. I really like it. I have a question about that. So I think we've talked yes. before, but why would that song be on the next album after Potemkin? Was it supposed to be on Potemkin? Or? I believe I heard once uh, they said that it was going to be on Potemkin. They just didn't have it done in time. I okay. think I heard that. Yeah, Lost yeah. the title track. <laughs> yeah, yeah, lost the title track. But it's funny because that song... I mean, maybe it's just uh, we're fooling ourselves, but that song seems to fit in so much better on this album than it would have on Potemkin. Yeah. I don't know. But uh, either way, you know, it's a, it's a fantastic song, one of my favorites. I'm going to go out there and say, actually, it's my least favorite song on the album, which okay, something about, I don't know, like I like the voice of the pig. You know, that's the whole idea is it's from the voice of the pig. Yeah, It's like an animal rights song. It just doesn't seem to work as well as other songs that they've done in those similar voices, like like a third-person voice. Right. Anyway, mm-hmm. so that's my thought on that. 
something really embarrassing. I want to back up a minute here, but I always yep. thought songs two and three were the same song. <laughs> so supporting okay, well, cast you know into Tertium non Detour, it's like, I thought it was the yeah. same. I thought it was just that break to me. seems like it's just going into another riff right. or something. Totally. Yeah. I love those songs individually, but yeah, when listening to it through, I, I hear you. I think we talked about Jawbreaker having two songs on 24 hour revenge therapy tracks two and three that we thought they were the same song going into See, box. Yeah. Cover. Yeah, because it's the exact same. I remember, tempo, Rain and yeah. Blood had that. The whole yeah, album yeah. was like that. Right. Amazing. Yeah. I love the two songs that we just talked about on the Propaganda album. I'm okay with them being one song or two songs or five yeah. songs, which is <laughs> really great. One of the uh, brilliant parts on this record is during uh, Humane Meat, um, which is a great song, where there's uh, a switch in tone in, totally. in the song during the switch in lyrical yeah. perspective they did the same thing on the last album on america's army where okay. when the the narration switches and then the tone of the song switches and it, it's brilliant when you you realize what's happening you just think god this is so much more advanced than your average like you know knuckleheaded rock band and i love knuckleheaded rock of course but little things like that you know just brilliant so whenever that happens when i'm listening to supporting cast i'm just like yes this is genius you know i love this So what about the lyrics then? Because you sort of touched on some of the lyrics. We haven't talked specifically. What things stand out? I honestly feel that Chris Hanna is one of the, the best lyricists of our time. He's he's just he's just he's an incredible lyricist. So yeah, I mean this album is is no exception. You know, it's 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 always a pleasure. Again, after Potemkin, it that album felt to me like more of a certainly not a concept album or anything, but it felt like a, a one big hole from start to end. Whereas supporting cast always felt to me like kind of a bunch of songs put together, which is what a record is. That's fine, but. <laughs> So they kind of had a different different feel to it. And so, yeah, lyrically with this one, it always felt a bit like, you know, I remember uh, my friend Mike, who you know, said to me shortly after this album came out, it kind of felt like, okay, here's the Animal Rights song. Here's the X song. Here's the Y song. And here's the Z song. More like a collection of stories rather than a big story bound together. Exactly. Exactly. Which is totally fine. But I, I wish Mike hadn't said that to me 15 years ago or whatever, because I never quite got past that. But, you know, as far as the actual lyrics go, I mean, they're great. I mean, I, I don't really know what, what else I can say, except they're fantastic. You know, one thing, I hadn't even thought about this till just now, but the song, The Bangers Embrace. Yeah, I was going to ask you about the that. Yeah, I, I, you know, I tend to forget about that song because it, it's not musically my favorite, but lyrically, I mean... That, that song is for people like you and me, like metalheads in their 40s who also love propaganda. That song is actually very touching and it's sure, actually yeah. very moving. And I know a lot of punk rockers kind of laugh at that song. I've seen people kind of joke about it and stuff. But to me, like the lyrics in that song are, are no joke at all. Life affirming. <laughs> yeah. Make fun of me, but they're beautiful. You know, like it, it's really a, a well-written song about it, something that means a lot to some of us. So I, I actually think the bangers embrace lyrically is is incredible. I can see you in a floral crown right now. <laughs> <laughs> um, one of the lines from Thanks. that song. Yeah. One of the lines from that song is uh, a half head in a whale shirt breathing in my face or something along those lines. And I always thought that yeah. line was brilliant because I've been on buses <laughs> before going to punk shows with this big guy like yeah. breathing at me and you know we're yeah. all in the same boat we're all going to the same show but it's such a yeah. weird group of weirdos going to a, a lot of these shows um, yeah. I wanted to mention this I'm not sure if you know this but on Scream Therapy which is the main podcast Todd told me when he was on that This Is Your Life is actually about his dad about his dad sitting you know, downstairs I, I did drinking know that. beer yeah I mean he says people like his dad but based on okay. his dad which I kind of blew my mind because 
I always think, you know, when you're having this sort of vitriol and yelling at people, which, you know, his vocals are very like, I'm yelling at you now, that you're yelling at someone that, you know, is, is over there as like some unknown right. sort of face. And of course, he was very, very close to his dad. That really shook me. And I think it's an amazing song. And I think all of Todd's mm-hmm. songs are amazing. But And you talked about the lyrics of Chris's songs, but Todd's lyrics are just so blunt and so in your face. And I just love them. The Todd songs in this record were a bit of a disappointment after his songs on Potemkin because his songs on Potemkin, oh my God, I have never heard music like that before out of any human being. Like those songs are so unique and just so different. Wow. These Todd songs, you know, Night Letters, um, the first half of Incalculable, I can't say that word, Incalculable Effects, you know, the first half of that song is like the weird Todd stuff. Then it goes into the more straight ahead, like hardcore. Yeah. Same with This Is Your Life. It's just kind of like raging. And it's it's good. But I mean, I wanted that weird, weird Todd that he's, you know, so capable of. And I feel like he did that all through. He's, he's done it even on Victory Lap. There's a couple songs that are actually there's only two songs in Victory Lap that have him that are written by him. He's just creating this music, which is otherworldly. There's no one else that makes music like that. And it's yeah. just something that's continued through propagandi's albums but also i think he always has those couple of real raging hardcore songs yeah that's true you know the ones on this one are really good and i think there's also a there's a subtext of his weirdness that's in these hardcore songs too that you can kind of hear there's so much going on in these songs musically and lyrically yeah you know i'm thinking of the riding the bike song on on failed states right right. how do you write a song about riding a bike (laughs) he does it his his lyrics are a, a great counterpoint to Chris's lyrics because they're they're very different and their songwriting styles are very different. I mean, yeah. what a band, right? To to put those two together and to make it to make it work. And then yeah, like just to to go back again to Todd opening the album with Night Letters. What a great opening! What a great Todd song. Yeah, without love, such a crusher. Right. What a heartbreaking song. Yeah. Me being the dummy that I am, sometimes it takes me 20 years to figure out what these songs are about. Mm -hmm. Realizing that Chloe is, I believe, either his dog or his cat, definitely a pet. He talks about his grandfather dying as well, but this idea of of Chloe slipping away, it's just like it got Mm -hmm. me when I realized what it was. And I'm not even a pet guy. I could care less about pets, but just the image of him (laughs) having this animal in his arms. And do you know if it was, is it a cat or a dog? I can't remember. Yeah, something like that. It could be a rabbit for all we know, but it's just. Right, it doesn't matter. Yeah. That song, that's another one. I feel like that one in Dear Coach's Corner kind of became the, I could be wrong here, but kind of became the the sort of classics off this album. But yeah, Without Love, because it was so you know, I believe up until that point that Chris hadn't really opened up that much in a song. I think we all knew him as this, you know, like political scientist guy who has like no emotions or something, you know, and, <laughs> and, and to, you know, I think that song, it was kind of a brilliant long game to like release five albums of like hardcore political analysis. And then this song, wow, it really, yeah, you know, like you're saying, it really hit me too when I heard it. And, and it still does. Every time I hear it, it's still a, a whopper. Let's just check out a little bit of that. Gives me chills every single time I hear it. Yeah. It's so good. Brilliant. You talked about political and, and that kind of rah-rah stuff that they've always done, and dog bless them for doing it, right? But I was reading something recently where someone asked Todd about sloganeering. You know, how do you avoid being a sloganeering band? And Todd just said, we avoid sloganeering by playing from the heart. How brilliant is that? Right. If you're playing from the heart and doing what you feel is right, is that sloganeering? Right. So the main cover, and also I have the double LP, Lucky Me, has a gatefold of this piece of art called The Triumph of Mischief, and it's by Kent Monkman. He's a Cree artist. He lives in Manitoba's Interlake region, which is about half an hour outside of Winnipeg. He's done a bunch of them, including one with Justin Trudeau about to be fisted. (laughs) The Triumph of Mischief. I think it's creepier than some of the Slayer albums. I think it's just you look at it and there's so much Mm -hmm. weird stuff going on and so many subtexts to uh, genocide against Mm -hmm. indigenous people. I guess it's all there in, in one piece. So that really sets the tone. 
it speaks to to the album as well, the tone of the album. Yeah. Todd's piece, which I believe on the CD is on the actual CD and on the album is inside on the booklet, calls it a post-vegetarian feast. You know, you've got this <laughs> severed hand on the dinner plate. You've got the guys from Propaganda eating these pieces of humans. This gets me too. On In the background on the walls, there's framed pictures of cute pigs and a monkey face. And they've got these like nice little pictures of animals in the background and they're just tearing apart these humans. And also I think Pol Pot is sitting beside them. Mm -hmm. What a piece of art. How long did that take him to draw? Yeah, that, that picture is fantastic. This is awesome. <laughs> yeah. Oh, to back up to the very beginning, this is the Beeves' first album. That's right. He came in as second guitar player before this album was recorded and an amazing guitar mm -hmm. player. And yeah. I think that's always why I felt like this album is superior to the ones before it, because it just added mm -hmm. that extra depth to it. Right. Uh, rhythm guitar parts. And I mean, before Chris is just, you know, trying to do it all and it's just not feasible. Yeah. So. Yeah. And Beeve had this, like, um, he did a lot of, not so much on this album, I guess, but with his previous band, I'm gapping, was it Giant Sons? Is that what they were called? I believe so. Yeah. He did a lot of, you know, weird guitar stuff, weird textures. And like, it wasn't just like rhythm guitar, lead guitar. It was just like this kind of whole other like approach to, I mean, I'm no guitarist, but this whole other approach. I want to say free jazz, but that just sounds. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> definitely though. Like, um, you know, working on like texture and atmosphere and, you know, I wouldn't say supporting cast is like this, like atmospheric textured album but like there's definitely a bit more yeah going on there sonically mm -hmm. with the guitars because of that so yeah no the beeves touch on this album is is fantastic yeah kind of interesting i was doing more research here and uh trying to figure out what was happening in 2009 and you're gonna laugh at this one but no effects <laughs> came out with even the word no effects makes us laugh and <laughs> they came out with an album called coaster in 2009 and it got a 5.5 .5 out of 10 on punk news and propaganda Ooh. this this album we're talking about came out same year and it got a 9 out of 10 so you know, right. ha haha you know haha no effects but just <laughs> interesting that one of the bigger punk bands had an album the same and it kind of tanked also voivod the album Infinity came out that year. That was the last mm. one with Piggy, or I guess the last music that Piggy had recorded. And also, right. you know, I have to mention the last album with Jason Newstead as well. <laughs> but, okay. Yeah. yeah. So that album came out the same year. And if Voivod was going to be an influence. And I mean, you know, is it just me or have those Voivod and No Effects albums kind of been forgotten? I mean, do you listen to those albums ever? No. I mean, uh, oh. I, I love both those bands, but I mean, I, all I can remember about Coaster is really liking the last song, which was the title track. Thinking it was really I good. Didn't get that far. The rest of the album. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the rest of the album, I can't even remember it. Voivod's album, I mean, I, I couldn't tell you a, a, a song name right now off that album. I remember it was good, of course, but I mean, yeah. Yeah, if we're going to listen to Voivod, we're going to go back to Dimension Hatros. And if we have to sure. listen to No Effects, probably go back to Ribbed or something or one of those albums earlier right. on. So, yeah. Tell me about Black Widow's Come to the Sabbath. This is the bonus track right, came after 10 right. minutes of silence. To be honest, I think it's ridiculous and, and stupid, but yeah. what is this song? Like, I don't know the proto-metal stuff as well as you do, but tell me what this is right. about. Black Widow were a, yeah, like a proto-metal band, late 60s, early 70s, kind of roughly speaking. All they're really known for is, is that song, but they're pretty good, like, you know, kind of sub Black Sabbath sort of stuff. But I, I wish this cover wasn't on, on the album as well. <laughs> I'm glad it's not just me. This was that era where it's like, oh, we're putting on a CD. Cool, let's do 10 minutes of silence, then like a silly bonus track. I mean, everyone was doing it. But I'm such a fan of, especially with punk rock, like just have it boom, boom, you know, nice and short and just over. You know, I don't really want 10 minutes of silence followed up by something else on here i forget what some spoken thing or something and yeah. then the bonus track the album if it ended at the end where it should end we talked about you know the last song last will and testament that song i was listening to yesterday it's kind of strange it almost feels like it's half a song it's got the really melodic part at the beginning which is awesome and then it kind of goes into this it doesn't seem to be complete in some ways and then it kind of fades out did you notice yeah. that matter? oh absolutely and that's one of my Again, it's hard to have a complaint about an album that's as great as this, but that's one of my complaints is it kind of falls apart at the end. And I don't know what it is because that song, if you just listen to it on its own, which I did in preparation for this, it's great. It kind of feels like two songs. There's this kind of slower intro part, which is really cool. And then it goes into the, the main song, which is also really cool. 
and the lyrics are great on that song are really good yeah but yeah somehow propaganda have always had really good closing songs and that one was like 9.9 out of 10 there is something was just not quite ready with that song or something in some ways it's kind of a cool way to end an album to have it kind of trail off especially at that point of their trajectory where nobody was really sure if this band would even continue you know there is all Mm -hmm. this uncertainty especially after Potemkin you know as well but the last song on Potemkin is like it's the end of the world and everything sucks everything is the worst right um, right. <laughs> that that felt like the final song that could be the last propaganda song. I mean, in sense, yeah. this one does as well. It's kind of a cool mm-hmm. way, I think. Now that I think about it, I don't. I'm not going to complain about it anymore. That that's kind of a neat neat way of doing it. It's a good. I, I think, and I don't want to sound like a broken record here. And I know it's a stupid thing to complain about, but I think for me, the problem is the bonus track stuff at the end. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm sorry, but I think if the album ended when that song ends, you know, and it's not just like boom, it's over. It's like. Uh, let's establish this so supporting cast <laughs> 9.9 out of 10 with the bonus track and then 10 out of 10 without the bonus track is that fair no it's not because you, <laughs> yours your 10 out of 10 is Potemkin right? is Potemkin yeah. yeah yeah it's a small complaint and if the band wants to have some fun and put a bonus track on go for it they can do that <laughs> we can't begrudge them after all the joy they've given us over the years yes exactly exactly all right any final thoughts oh I mean it's propaganda. They're maybe the best band that I've ever heard. I mean, and this album is, I consider the band's peak to be like Potemkin onwards to like present day, basically, you know, they're mm-hmm. still kind of at their peak. So this album is the work of one of my favorite bands of all time during one of my favorite eras of their recording output so if i've said anything critical it's just because you know i I love them so much and like i love the previous album so much but this album i mean it's it's this is almost as good as as punk rock can get absolutely yeah i feel the same way and i second your very eloquent wrap-up of this album before we go here do you have anything you want to plug anything going on that you want to let people know about um, I mean, I suppose in the context of, you know, talking about uh, propaganda, um, I would encourage people to check out uh, the documentary that I was the head writer for, A Fat Wreck. It was looking at Fat Records and Propaganda was one of the, the main bands that we featured in that movie. It's available wherever people watch movies these days. I write for Decibel Magazine weekly on their site and their magazine and for BraveWords.com and other places. So, yeah, I'm around. People can reach out and say hello. I'm always happy to talk. On Twitter, Greg Pratt Writer. Just reminding people to not forget to listen to the Screen Therapy podcast, which is uh, the main podcast that I've been doing for 40 episodes. So there's lots to listen to while we take a bit of a hiatus here to talk about amazing albums here on Flex Your Head. My writing and other stuff can be found at ScreamTherapyHQ.com. So check it out. And thanks so much, Greg, for being here. Let's go out with that weirdo bonus track, shall we? I guess if we (laughs) if we must. Thanks a lot for having me. It's always a pleasure. All right. See ya. Your head!